We'll now have a, uh, a talk by Professor Boaz Ganur, uh, the Dean of the Lada School of Government uh, um, and the uh, Chair for Counterterrorism and also the Founder and Executive Director of the International Institute of Counterterrorism at the IDC. Um, uh, Dr. Ganur also served as a Corret D Distinguished Fellow at Hoover at Stanford and ha has taught... Um, uh, both at the graduate and undergraduate level at uh, Stanford, and I think is known as, you know, probably a premier expert in this field, and we're very, very pleased that you could join us. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gidon. Actually, we have a very short time. It takes me more than an hour to start my engines, and I have only a little bit more than a half an hour, so... Uh, what I would like to do in the short time that I have here, share with you some of my thoughts about current uh, terrorism threats, and uh, as much as we can, maybe uh, some conclusions about counterterrorism, uh, lesson learned from those, uh, those specific threats. So with no further ado, I would actually uh, uh, start. And uh, as you can see, I, I've chosen to uh, start my uh, discussion uh, with the uh, phenomenon which got the name of uh, the Arab Spring. Actually, I will go a little bit uh, earlier uh, in the sequence of time. I see uh, among you uh, few faces which seems to me like students. So uh, if we have students and they are thinking about their future career, my recommendation, you should seriously, seriously consider to be a scholar. It's a very good profession. The reason is, there are many reasons why it's a good profession, but one of the main reasons is because I don't know any other profession in which you get a sabbatical year every few years, and you can lay back, think, research, and get full salary. So uh, definitely should think about it, but I'm saying this in all, because I want to go back to my sabbatical year. It was 2008, 2009, uh, and it was in uh, one of the best uh, and the most magnificent places on earth, uh, Stanford University. I was uh, teaching there. But it was a very interesting time because it was the year of the election of President Obama. I'm, I'm talking about the first term, just before the election itself. All my students were very active in, uh, in the Obama campaign, and the, the whole Bay Area was uh, very supportive uh, uh, to Obama campaign and to Obama himself. And uh, Obama won the elections. Immediately after, a few weeks after he won the elections, he uh, uh, launched his first... Uh, uh, step, his first uh, uh, foreign policy uh, step. And uh, you would imagine what would be, what was this uh, activity that he'd chosen to do. He'd, he traveled to Cairo and he gave the Cairo speech. Now, immediately after the Cairo speech, a few uh, hours after the Cairo speech, I was uh, invited to uh, speak uh, at the San Francisco television to comment on the Cairo speech. So in order that you would see that I'm not, not bluffing, I'm giving you the, this uh, picture. Not a very good picture of mine, I apologize, but it shows that it's true. Now, the first question they posed to me was, what is the reaction in Israel to the speech in Cairo? And I said, look, uh, I have to admit that I don't really know because I'm temporarily living here in the Bay Area. But on the other hand, I'm an Israeli. Even if I don't know, I have some answer for you. So, uh, so I think that uh, in Israel we have mixed feelings toward the speech in Cairo. They said, can you elaborate on that? I said, of course. On one hand, when we're listening to what was said there, it seems to us that this doesn't reflect a full uh, understanding of the complexity of the situation in the Middle East, in the Arab world, in the Muslim world. On the other hand, is uh, trying to achieve... Uh, a new approach or to, uh, to start a new approach towards the Muslim world and maybe something good will come out of it uh, and we will be one of the main benefactors of that. So we have a mixed feelings of hope and concern. The second question was, what is the reaction of the Jewish community in the Bay Area to the speech in Cairo? And I said, look, I definitely do not represent the Jewish community in the Bay Area. I'm just a visitor here. But since you've asked me, I think that the Jewish community in the Bay Area have mixed feelings toward the speech in Cairo, which is a combination of hope and concern. <laughs> so they were totally confused and say, so what's the difference between the reaction in Israel and the reaction of the Jewish community in the Bay Area? I said, look, in Israel, we have a lot of concern and very little hope. In the Bay Area, there is a lot of hope and very little concern. 
I have to say that uh, um, a few months after that, when I was uh, reading the speech of who was at that time uh, the counterterrorism coordinator of President Obama of the White, White House, uh, Mr. John Brennan, I was even more concerned. And I was more concerned because he was saying in one of the uh, uh, articles there something along the lines that terrorism is not the enemy of the United States. Well, Mr. Counterterrorism Coordinator, I find it a little bit difficult when, uh, uh, and problematic when a counterterrorism coordinator is saying that terrorism is not the enemy. Uh, yes, you are playing with words. As a scholar, I do it from time to time as well. Terrorism is a tactic. A tactic cannot be an enemy. Therefore, terrorism is not the enemy. Okay. But then, when I read that uh, Islamists and jihadists uh, are not the threat because jihad is ordained to do those uh, good uh, things and uh, holy causes and so on and so forth. I wrote an article which said if global jihad is not the enemy of the United States, then who is the enemy of the United States? And uh, um, I started with that because I think that the new approach that came from American foreign policy didn't give birth to the Arab Spring, but gave back wind to the Arab Spring. And the process was authentic process within the Muslim world, but it, reflects, it was reflected by uh, the American policy. Now you would say, okay, so what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that, at least in my humble view, this Arab Spring is a very dangerous and very negative process that started a few years ago, and we are still in the midst of the process. In the coming uh, days, we're probably going to see even Yemen uh, falling into uh, uh, other types of uh, Islamist radical, the Houthis, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, when I was traveling to the United States after the Arab Spring started, it was very difficult to persuade some of my colleagues there that this is a problematic process. Because on the face of it, it's great. We have liberal democratic revolution against traditional autocratic uh, not to say dictatorship, but autocratic regimes. And uh, what's wrong with that? It might have uh, involved bloodshed, fine, but you know, democracies are in many cases being built on bloodshed at the end of the day. But for the long term, this is a very positive uh, outcome. And my answer was, my friends, even the term Arab Spring reflects, reflects this positive connotation, which seems to me very wrong, because in Israel we refer to that as the Islamist uh, Spring, and not the Arab, uh, not the Arab uh, 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 um, yeah, the Arab Spring. Thank you very much. Who said that? I want to see the hand. Thank you. <laughs> so, what did we see in this uh, in this overall process? We saw a rebellion that started with a quite liberal democratic group uh, that uh, later on was taken by the radical, by the Islamists, uh, the Islamists, uh, which is a combination of Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, elements together with uh, Salafists, Salafist jihadists. Uh, they uh, uh, toppled down the regime, the government, and the uh, uh, leadership, and, they, uh, and the uh, replacement to this uh, traditional leadership was chaos, ungoverned territories. Ungoverned territories, this is a honeypot for uh, Islamist, jihadist, terrorists coming from all over the world, those foreign fighters that came to those uh, uh, no man's land, and uh, together with local prisoners, Terrorists, archi-terrorists that were set free from uh, the prisoners, they joined in and they created this dangerous outcome of the Arab Spring. From here, let's zoom in a little bit on, on Syria and especially on ISIS. You can see in front of you the uh, clashes area of, uh, of uh, the civil war in, um, in Syria. Just in order to uh, show how chaotic the situation is, let me show you all the, uh, or some of the elements which are fighting there as we speak. So you can imagine how chaotic the situation is because in some places and in some cases those elements are fighting against each other. In other places they are joining the uh, forces against the enemy, against the Assad regime, and uh, against uh, Hezbollah and Iran. And uh, for that matter, uh, let me uh, make some order in this chaotic situation and suggest to divide uh, those groups into uh, seven clusters. Uh, the first one 
is the Sunni Salafists, the global jihadists, uh, and I refer to ISIS or the Islamic State as it's being called today. The second element, which is fighting the first one as well, including the Assad regime enemies, it's the uh, Sunni Salafist local jihadists, uh, which is uh, uh, represented by Jabhat al-Nusra. And then the third Islamist element are the Sunni Muslim Brotherhood, which is being supported by Saudi Arabia. And then we have the Kurds, which are trying to defend the Kurds' interest, mainly in the north and the east-north part of, uh, of Syria. And then we have those who started everything, the Free Syrian Army, those uh, pseudo-liberal uh, democratic elements that already have been neglected. Uh, a friend of mine who uh, conducted uh, recently research, uh, Professor Peter Nauman from uh, King's College, uh, uh, he was conducting a, a research about this uh, phenomenon of foreign fighters traveling uh, uh, to Syria. He traveled to the border between uh, Turkey and Syria, and he said that the whole, uh, um, the, the whole uh, face of the, the villages which are neighboring the border have changed because there is a new phenomenon there. Um, new stores are popping up in those villages. Those are fashion stores. And they are selling uniforms. And you can get into one of those stores and buy your uniforms of the specific group that you want to join later on when you're uh, crossing to uh, Syria. So you can buy uh, ISIS uh, uh, uniforms or Jabhat al-Nusra or whatever. He wanted to buy a free Syrian army uh, uh, uniforms and said, we are sorry, we cannot sell it to you. We don't have, there is no demand for that here. So uh, this is the fifth uh, element. The sixth one is Hezbollah, Hezbollah and Iran, Revolutionary Guards, which actually, they are the one who protect the regime of Assad. It's not anymore the Assad uh, army or the Syrian army. Uh, without the support of the Iranians and Hezbollah, Assad would fall long ago. But there is another element, and this element actually worries the whole world, but particularly the Western uh, society, and maybe with a special focus on Europe, but I wouldn't uh, turn a blind eye to other parts of the world, uh, of the Western world together. And I'm talking about the mercenaries, I'm talking about the foreign fighters. And uh, the estimation today that as we speak, we have at least 10,000 foreign fighters which are fighting in Syria right now. They are coming from many countries altogether, more than 60 countries. By the way, those are the numbers or the figures that we know. We don't know how many we don't know about them, which already traveled to Syria. When you compare the numbers of the foreign fighters uh, in the last two years in Syria to uh, uh, the other case of foreign fighters, and I'm talking about 79, 89, the war in Afghanistan, in which foreign fighters were traveling to Afghanistan, and they, by the way, gave birth later on to Al-Qaeda and to the whole sequence of those terrorist attacks that occurred in uh, the Western society, including 9-11 and, uh, and other uh, attacks. Uh, what we've seen in the uh, late 70s, early 80s is chicken feed compared to uh, the threat of, uh, of those elements. Um, and it's not just uh, that they are opposing uh, a threat to the United States, because unlike the Afghan alumni, the Afghan veterans, those people are coming already in many cases from the Western countries, from European countries, and they would just return to their homelands. So I would argue that what we see today and what we saw in the recent weeks, uh, and we'll discuss that in a moment, the differences between those types that we saw, uh, what we saw is just uh, the beginning of a trend, beginning of a new breed of terrorism, uh, that we all should uh, uh, try to analyze, understand, and get ready to uh, in, in the future. I had a meeting uh, a few weeks ago with uh, a European uh, uh, head of security service, and we talked about the foreign fighters phenomenon. And uh, he said, it's a, it's a small country, he said, you know, it's a big problem to Europe. Not really our concern. Because we don't have large Muslim communities, we don't have large Islamist uh, elements, and we don't know about even one uh, foreign fighters traveling from our country uh, to Syria. My answer was the fact that you don't know about doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but forget about that. I'm asking the question, why Mahdi Namush, who is the uh, lone wolf that conducted the attack in Brussels against the Jewish museum there, why did he attack in Brussels? He's a Frenchman. 
His profile is very similar to many other uh, 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 terrorists uh, of that kind. He uh, was a second generation Muslim immigrant. He was uh, um, not assimilated to the society. He was engaged in petite crime. He was captured, brought to jail. He was radicalized in the jail system, something that we see time and again and again. And then when he finished to serve his sentence, he traveled to Syria. He was even more radicalized in Syria and then traveled back to France. Now the question is, why didn't he attack in France? Does he have any shortage in potential targets, Jewish targets in France? No, because he understood that he's probably under the radar of the security services in France. And he said to himself, it's quite easy to cross the border to uh, uh, Belgium. We will conduct a attack there and we will return. And that's exactly what he did. The answer to that, or the, the, the lesson learned from that phenomenon, is that as an outcome of the Schengen Agreement, the Schengen Agreement is the free movement in uh, the EU. As an outcome of the Schengen Agreement, you, Europe as a whole is under threat. And from there on, you cannot say that I am not that concerned because we don't have a large uh, Islamist community. We don't know about foreign fighters fighting here. The problem is that you would have foreign fighters coming to your country if you have worthy targets, if you don't have efficient security service, if you are not aware to the threat, and they would attack on your uh, territory altogether. Why do we go back? That's interesting. The ISIS phenomenon. Well, in order to comprehend what is ISIS all about, the Islamic State, we need to go back to 2002, 2003. It all started with a guy answering the name Abu Musaib al-Zarqawi. By, by the way, from the name, you can already conclude that this is a Jordanian from his origin, coming from Zarqa. So Abu Musaib al-Zarqawi, after the American uh, took over uh, um, Iraq, created uh, his group to fight the Americans, and uh, after a short period of time, he asked the uh, support, he asked the guidance, and he wanted to accept the leadership of bin Laden and Zawahiri, his uh, deputy. So he asked them uh, to change the name and to become Al-Qaeda in Iraq. There was a lot of quarrels between them. At the end of the day, they gave him the permission. And from 2003, what we see is a branch of Al-Qaeda, which is called Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which was very active in their attacks against the United States, against the Iraqi regime, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi was uh, killed, targeted killings, by the Americans. So his successor was Abu Omar al-Baghdadi. Abu Omar al-Baghdadi was also killed uh, in a targeted killing in 2007, and his successor was Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who is the leader of uh, the uh, group uh, as we speak. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, uh, before he was uh, nominated as the head of uh, uh, ISIL, the uh, Islamic State in the Levant, and later on ISIS, before he was nominated, he was in the jail. He was in the prison in Iraq, and uh, he was guarded by Americans, and when he was set free, he promised to his guards, I'll see you in New York, and it didn't mean that he will come there as a tourist. So uh, this Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is one of the worst terrorist villains ever, I would say. And there is a good competition, starting from Carlos, moving on to uh, bin Laden, and so on and so forth. Why is so dangerous? Because he referred to himself as the successor of Muhammad, no more and no less than that. Nobody did that before. Bin Laden didn't dare to do it. Zawahiri, who is a religious authority, didn't dare to do it. He nominated himself as the caliphate of the new Muslim caliphate, Islamist caliphate. He did that in June 2014 in Mosul after he took over Mosul. He also adopted the name Abu Bakr, which reflects the fact that he was the successor of Muhammad, and therefore uh, he refers to himself as such. Now, we ask ourselves, how could they be so strong militarily-wise? Why they had so many success in the military field in the last year? The first reason is because they took all the former generals, or many of the former generals of Saddam uh, regime. And this is also, in a way, an outcome of, in my view, and the Americans in the room, please forgive me, uh, a, a wrong American foreign policy. I don't blame the Americans that wanted to get out of Iraq. I would do the same, no doubt about it. But the fact that they nominated 
the, as the leader of the state, Al-Malaki, who is a Shiite. And Al-Malaki actually decapitated, not literally, he just uh, threw out of the, uh, of the army all the generals, which were Sunni generals, and they were furious, they wanted to revenge, and they joined Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, they joined ISIS. The two deputies, military deputies of uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi are former generals in Saddam, uh, uh, Saddam army. On top of that, you know, many uh, people around the world are saying, look, yeah, it's a problem. They had some success, a little luck, military-wise, military but they cannot sustain the territory that they control. They cannot give the services that they need to the public. Well, I have news for you. They, like many other hybrid terrorist organizations, like Hamas, like uh, Hezbollah and other organizations, investing a lot of time in developing those alternative systems of uh, the Dawah activity, giving religious services, welfare services, and also other practical services to their constituency. And for that, they've created the structure of district governors all over Iraq, in some parts of, uh, of um, Syria as well. But they are also very uh, sophisticated in their uh, military uh, um, framework and I won't get into all of the segments that uh, they've uh, created. I will just mention the media council, which we all know is so efficient in the propaganda that they, uh, that they use uh, in order to uh, uh, incite uh, uh, many youngsters to join them or to be inspired by them and conduct lone wolf's uh, uh, attacks. This is another subject matter I want to touch upon. Uh, but before that... You know, we have a debate, even in my institute at the ICT, the Institute for Counterterrorism, uh, we have a debate among the scholars uh, who has and who will have the upper hand in this competition. I didn't mention the competition, the competition between Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Now, you need to understand, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, when he made this decision that he becomes the new caliph, immediately he uh, set himself as the enemy, not just of uh, Hezbollah, uh, Assad regime, <clears throat> even Muslim Brotherhood, also of Al-Qaeda itself. And now there is a rift and a real rivalry between Al-Qaeda and uh, um, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and ISIS. Jabhat al-Nusra, which is the second uh, strongest uh, Islamist element in Syria, is also a split or a creature that was created by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi himself. When the war, the civil war started in Syria, he actually allocated Syrian or, or Syrian nationalists from his own uh, organization in Iraq and he sent them to fight in the name of ISIS to fight in Syria. Uh, the leader of, uh, of this group nominated by him was al-Julani. You can learn from the name that his origin is coming from the Golan Mountains. But after a while, after he, uh, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi uh, uh, nominated himself as to be the caliph, there was a rift between Jabhat al-Nusra and ISIS. So Jabhat al-Nusra asked the protectorate of uh, Zawahiri, al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, and they got that. But Zawahiri wanted to bridge the gap between ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra and to make peace between those two elements. So he sent a mediator to mediate between the two uh, groups. What happened in a very short period of time when the mediator landed in Iraq, he was assassinated immediately by uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and this created a rift, uh, a total rift between the two elements, actually the three elements, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and Jabhat al-Nusra. So the question is, who's going to win this internal rift between the two of them? For that, I need to refer to Coca-Cola. And why Coca-Cola? I'm sure you're familiar with the slogan, the, uh, the propaganda, the slogan, the advertisement of Coca-Cola. Always it used to be, we are the real thing. Compared to whom? Pepsi-Cola, of course. So this concept of we are the real thing <clears throat> is very common when we see the evolution and development of terrorist organization in modern times. If you take, for example, the IRA, which had uh, those splits that ended with the real IRA, they even use the name real IRA. If you take a PFLP, Habash uh, organization, that gave birth to PFLP GC, General Command. We are the real thing. We are the General Command of the PFLP, Jibril organization. Hamas refers to himself as the real thing compared to the Fatah. And I would argue that ISIS refers to themselves as the real thing compared 
to Al-Qaeda. And what we see uh, almost on a weekly basis, we see individuals, networks, groups, and organizations changing their loyalty from Zawahiri, from Al-Qaeda to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Maybe the uh, worst or the biggest uh, problem was when a whole organization, the Ansar Beit al-Magdas, the strongest Al-Qaeda element in Sinai as a whole, transferred the loyalty from Al-Qaeda just recently uh, to ISIS. And I tend to believe, again, against some of my friends and colleagues' uh, point of view, I tend to believe that we will see this trend, uh, uh, this, uh, trend uh, strengthening, and ISIS will actually take over the, the leading role of Al-Qaeda and the leading role of uh, Jabhat al-Nusra. Which brings us to uh, trying to explore the differences between those different types of attacks that we saw in the recent year uh, in Europe, for example, or even today uh, in Israel. Um, basically, I would suggest to differ with, between two types of terrorist, uh, terrorist attacks. Organized attacks and personal initiative attack, or a lone wolf, or a local uh, uh, initiative attack. The differences between the two is... The question, was a, you know, a terrorist organization involved in one of the stages of the execution of a terrorist attack? What are the stages of execution of a terrorist attack? First one is the initiation. Somebody needs to initiate the attack. Second one is the planning of the attack, the recruitment of the attacker, the training of the attackers, the uh, uh, creating the, or, or preparing the attack, all the operational uh, um, uh, methods and operational needs that you have, and at the end of the day, pulling the trigger, conducting the attack. Those are the stages. If a terrorist organization is involved even in one of those stages, this is an organized attack, organized by a terrorist organization. If all those stages are being conducted without the involvement of a terrorist state, this is either a personal initiative or a local initiative, independent state. This is the lone wolf type of attack. It could be inspired by a terrorist organization, but the organization doesn't take a role in the decision-making process of this uh, specific uh, attack. Um, the differences between the attacks that we saw in Paris just recently and the previous attacks that have been in Paris, in Belgium, in other places in Europe is exactly uh, here. The, in the last uh, few years, I would say that the main concern of security services in Europe was the personal and local initiative attacks, meaning those people which will be inspired by a terrorist organization and will conduct the attack, the Mahdi Namush uh, type or Muhammad Mara uh, type of uh, attacks. But they were quite surprised to see that the attacks, the recent attacks in Paris, was not that case. At first, when uh, the attack was only uh, against the Charlie Hebdo uh, uh, newspaper, the immediate reaction was, okay, so here we are seeing another local group which is being inspired, local initiative attack, not a terrorist organization behind it, but after a while, uh, the day after, actually, they found out that this is orchestrated by a terrorist organization, by ACAP. ACAP is the Al-Qaeda in the Arab Peninsula. This is the most active uh, uh, part of Al-Qaeda since 9-11. Most of the attacks that occurred or uh, have been named by Al-Qaeda since 9-11 came from Aqab. Aqab situated in Yemen and he was, it, was, uh, it was headed by Al-Awlaki, uh, which also uh, was killed uh, by the Americans a few, uh, few years ago. I want to share with you uh, very briefly this radicalization process. And I want to, uh, to suggest to you a research that I did uh, three years ago, um, which on the face of it doesn't make sense. I'm trying to make a comparison between the sociological processes that uh, uh, the first and the second generation have experienced in two different uh, geographical areas under two total different conditions. I'm talking about the Palestinians after 67 occupation, and I'm talking about the uh, uh, Muslim immigrants to Europe. So the first generation of the Muslim immigrants to Europe, excuse me, of uh, the uh, uh, Palestinians, are people which have been living in the West Bank in Gaza in 67. Israel took over. But at first, they were very happy with the new situation. 
Some of you even remember those periods of time. Talking about 67, 68, 69. Because the Israeli labor market was totally open to them. They traveled to Israel. Unemployment went to zero. Actually, even lesser than zero because even kids started to work in Israel. And they earned a lot of money compared to what they used to. But practically, compared to the Israeli income, this was uh, a very uh, low uh, uh, salaries, uh, blue-collar type of activity, hard works that uh, the local Israelis didn't want to work in. I'm talking about agriculture, uh, construction, and so, on, so forth, and so forth. They, the saving that they had, they invested, among other things, in the, in the education of their kids. As you'll see in a moment, the second generation Palestinian are the, one of the most educated people in the Arab world as an outcome of the investment that was uh, done there. What happened in the first generation of the uh, Muslim immigrants to Europe? Well, those people who were there, they came from because of two reasons. One of them were political uh, uh, asylum seekers because they were hunted in their home countries based on their political uh, point of view. Either wanted to improve their welfare uh, situation and they immigrated. Now, for those people traveling to the European state, getting the citizenship of the European state, that was the utmost, the biggest achievement in their lives. That's what they dreamed all their life to achieve, and they achieved it. So under those conditions, uh, they were very happy with the new situation. What was offered to them to work was, again, blue collar, uh, 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 very difficult uh, uh, work, not very uh, good salaries, uh, those works that the local didn't want to work uh, there, and so on and so forth, their kids were much more educated than them. Moving on to the second generation of the, of the Palestinians. Well, first of all, they are literate in Hebrew, many of them uh, used to live in Israel, actually, the whole week and travel to the villages back only on the weekends. So, they were, they were not assimilated in the Israeli society, but they were living within the Israeli society. This situation created an identity crisis, created an unintegrated uh, situation, and of course they kept their own different value system. Uh, they were much more educated, as I said before, and this created a generation gap within the Palestinian family itself. Because they looked on their parents that was quite happy with the new situation, and they couldn't figure out how could it happen. The same thing actually happened to the second generation Muslim immigrants to Europe. They were born as local citizens. Nobody gave them any favor by granting them the citizenship of this country. They were literate in the local language. They were not assimilated to the society, by the way, because of uh, both. They didn't want, their parents didn't want to assimilate, and the local didn't want them to be assimilated and integrated in the society. They had an identity crisis. Who am I? Am I, uh, am I uh, an Algerian or am I a French uh, uh, person? Who am I? Different value system whatsoever, much more educated, and again, a generation crisis in the family itself. I would like to argue that in both cases, the solution was and still is an alternative system of values, new identity, new law and order altogether. And as much as the... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Palestinians, the second generation Palestinian, they were the one to, that brought the Intifada, the first Intifada, which occurred in 1987. When those kids that were born in 67 were 20 years old. Those are the people who created the Intifada in the West Bank and Gaza. My, the title of my, my, uh, uh, my article was a Prospected Intifada in Europe. To sum this up and maybe leave uh, uh, time for one or two questions, um, the question is, okay, so if you shared your criticism with us, uh, you think that uh, the Western society, the American policy was wrong, what should have been done or what should have been said in reference to uh, the, uh, this Islamist terrorist phenomenon? For that, let me share with you another anecdote. About six years ago, I was invited to give a talk in Brussels. And just before I was giving my talk, there was another speaker. He was an imam, a Muslim religious cleric coming from Sudan. And he said to, uh, to the audience, how dare you? How dare you refer to Islam as if it is something to do with terrorism? Do you know what Islam is all about? Islam is the religion of peace and clemency. He was saying, you are using the term jihadi terrorism all the time. Do you know what jihad is all about? 
Jihad is all about doing the good deeds and not those atrocities. And he was very persuasive. Then was my turn. He was still in the room. So I approached to him personally and I said, my friend, let me thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I'm saying that sincerely. Let me thank you from the bottom of my heart that you took the trouble to fly all over the way from Sudan to Brussels to share with us those two important messages, which we need to understand that Islam is not about terrorism. The jihad has nothing to do with terrorism. Let me thank you for saying that. But between you and me, my friend, I don't really understand why did you bother to fly all over the way from Sudan to Brussels to share with us those two important messages. Instead of staying in Sudan or crossing to Yemen or crossing to Egypt or crossing to Afghanistan or Pakistan, and I can name so many countries altogether, and tell those people which are beheading innocent civilians under the name of, of Islam, raising the flag of jihad while they do that, that what they do is against Islamic concept and jihadi verdicts. Because if you have a task in your life as a Muslim religious cleric is to preach that every moment to your own constituency. We don't have a problem with Islam. We have a problem within Islam. And the only one who can save Islam from the Islamists, the only one who can, say and can have the solution to this problem are the Muslims themselves, and especially the Muslim religious clerics. This is the kind of message that I would expect that the leaders of the world, President Obama, the European countries would say, don't sweep the dust under the rug and say, there is nothing to do with religion, it's nothing to do with Islam. It has a lot to do with Islam. This is not Islam, true. But you have to call out and tell the vast majority of the Muslims around the world, you should stand up and save Islam from those Islamists. With this happy note, I would uh, conclude my presentation. You want to take uh, a question or we don't have time? We'd love to take uh, at least 20, but we don't okay. have any time at all. Very well. Thank you very much. Well, thanks so much.